Ready. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Uh, today, I'm here with Simon Cooper, the author of Chums, uh, how a tiny cast of Oxford Tories took over the UK. I don't know why I managed to forget the the, <laughs> the subtitle there. And yeah, uh, financial uh, Financial Times columnist Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you. So yeah, first off, thanks for uh, thanks for sending me the book. Um, it's been a really interesting read. I mean, it's. Uh, a friend of mine asked me when I was reading it, like, how is it? Because uh, she was like, well, that could be interesting, but maybe the subject matter is a bit boring. And I was like, no, no, no. You managed to keep it, like, ticking along at, at quite a frenetic pace that, that makes it, like, really engaging to read, you know, you know uh, even though you're maybe talking about some... Yeah, you're, to you're basically talking about the careers of the, the politicians that gave us, the, that are now in power. So it's, it's brilliant that it's so entertaining. <laughs> well, it's about the origins. I mean, you know everybody's youth I find interesting it casts a light if it casts a light on who they became and that's the idea of the book yeah I mean there's a number of quotes and I'll get some of them up that are really telling that you can it's really plain and simple or plain to me that the things that that happened in their sort of more formative years that have given us the kind of government that we now have so I'm looking forward to, to getting into this so why don't we start with um, why you decided to write the book and, and sort of what, what inspired you at, at first it was really watching television the night of Brexit, um, you know, the night that I think so many of us remember very clearly. I'm, I'm watching aghast. And as I see these people, you know, traipse across my screen, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, David Cameron, Rees Mogg, Dominic Cummings, I think I know exactly where they come from. I know the forces that shaped them because they were at Oxford with me or just before me. And so, I mean, there's a quote from Napoleon, it might be apocryphal, but I use it to start the book. Um, to understand a man, you have to understand the world as it was when he was 20. And so that's what this book really tries to do. It goes back to when they were 20, and then it explains the present through the past. Yeah. So one of the, the key themes of, of the first couple of chapters is is this, yeah, the, the time at Oxford and in the the students union and the, the debating club and the, the whole host of different sort of social organizations that, that you, you go through and the student organizations. Do you think that the, do you think that these like clubs and, and debate teams and, and things, are they forming and the institution itself, are they forming the characters? Do you think, or is this, do, because the sense I got reading the book was that a lot of these people almost came to Oxford, like not quite fully formed, but like uh, they, they were kind of like etched out of the, the marble or the, the granite. You know, you could see the person that they were p probably going to become. It wasn't like the institutions that shaped them. Like, was, was that the impression that you got or am I misreading? Yeah, I mean, I felt that they knew looking back now. I didn't realize this at the time, but I feel now they knew where they were going. From teenage, they knew they were going to be ruling the country one day. <clears throat> I think being a politically interested public school boy who's heading for Oxford, you sort of take it for granted. Of course, you're going to run the country. That's what your caste has always done. And so then the question is, what kind of a ruler are you planning to be? Did Oxford shape them? I mean, to a large degree, yes. Oxford's not the whole story. Obviously, public school is part of the story. But, I mean, it's not a coincidence that of 15 prime ministers since the war, 11 went to Oxford, three didn't go to university, and only Gordon Brown, who went to Edinburgh, went to another university. So Oxford has a role in this story. And in fact, you can tell the story of British politics of the last 25 years without reference to any other university, which is really quite astounding. So Oxford, especially through the Oxford Union, the debating club, helps bring them together trains them in the kind of public speaking that's that's revered or that helps you in British politics and then carries them on this conveyor belt together to Westminster. So maybe for people who, who aren't as familiar with like the political world or uh, the, the the norms of of the yeah of politics in Britain and the House of Commons and public speaking what skills are they learning and what skills are, are are those that they're that are maybe not even being taught as such but th those that are valued by this like institution and group and um cast of people like what is it that they're learning and and honing for 
that move from like that conveyor belt at the oxford union it's not particularly i would say debating brilliance that matters so much i mean someone like william Hague had that and so he would always beat tony blair in the debates at prime minister's question time but it wouldn't help him much public didn't really care uh, michael gove has that but it's a less important skill now than sort of being an entertainer being a funny quick speaker and when and having tricks like when the opponent has stronger arguments you just ignore their arguments you make an ad hominem attack or you know you pretend emotion by lowering your voice when you really want to get something across um so it's all these little tricks changing the subject uh when you're losing that johnson has in spades and i mean i think most people realize boris johnson doesn't really have an interest in making policy and in, in running a country and uh, that's not what he does the british public has elected the kind of most entertaining speaker of his generation as prime minister and those skills are taught at oxford not just in the union I mean, one thing i argue in the book is that a lot of the kind of elite british education system is teaching people to write and speak about subjects about which they know very little and at Oxford and Cambridge, that's done through the tutorial system where you write an essay, elegant, but usually without all that much substance because you haven't read enough and you're only 19 years old. You present it to the tutor, the tutor points out the holes in your argument, and then you have to talk for an hour your way around the holes in your own argument. And so what you're seeing is uh, verbal performance and good writing, elegant writing, are the qualities that our elite politicians have been trained in. And obviously it's not enough. It's not what you'd want running the country. Contrast that with much more boring German politicians like Angela Merkel or Olaf Scholz, who, who don't have those qualities. What is it, do you think, about British politics that values those traits so much? Like, well, Because clearly we're not interested, unfortunately, or at least we haven't come across the, the sensible kind of politician that... that that we would like to elect, like we've elected Boris Johnson, like all, yeah, along with all of his flaws, and like I don't think anyone in Britain is is unaware of 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 his flaws and yeah, his track record at this point, like at least to an extent. Y you know, it's it's a joke that he's a liar and a charlatan, and and we we continue to elect him. Like, what is it? Do you think that's that's like making us so? yeah so likely to vote for people with those characteristics is it because that's what we've always known or is it because they're the only people that end up in the position to get elected well i mean for a start there was a 30-year period from 1964 to 1994 when both main parties are always led by people who've been to state school you know think of uh, leaders like margaret thatcher harold wilson ted heath so at the time it was thought in kind of modernizing 60s britain the british public doesn't want toffs anymore and so they're kind of moved away from top table, but they still proliferate at the top end of the Tory party, just not as a leader. And then Tony Blair breaks the taboo, uh, you know, public school boy who becomes Labour leader and does very well politically. Blair isn't from the hereditary upper class. They, they let occasional people in, and his father had been raised by Glaswegian dock workers, came very much from the working class, and the, the family moves upwards over two generations. But anyway, so Blair shows the Tories, you can have a public school boy leading the party the public will wear it. And so then you get Cameron and later Johnson. And I think that it taps into a very ancient British reflex that public school, Eton, signifies leader. When British people talk about leadership, often that connotes upper class. You always used to have that in the cricket team, that if cricket had been to Cambridge, he was seen as a future England captain. And then Oxford, I think wrongly to much of the population, connotes brains. So uh, Johnson wasn't just a funny man. He'd been to Oxford and he could quote, you know, Virgil and Horace, and therefore he must be brainy enough to lead the country. And also uh, what he said carried a kind of intellectual weight, despite his funniness, because if he's saying that we can leave the EU and stay in the single market and enjoy all the benefits, well, he must know because, you know, educated man. So those things are, are, are I kind of, I kind of think deep in the British psyche, when they see someone like Cameron, when they hear someone like Cameron, many people feel, you know, they feel resentment, but they also feel, oh, well, he's born to rule. So I think that's one of the things that's going on. And then speaking well is, I mean, British politics has always been seen as a kind of 
terrain of gentlemen, cultivated people, not technocrats. Technocrats are boring. Um, they, they are not sort of easy to embrace. And so if you have the gentleman qualities, you can become prime minister. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange situation. It's like, it's almost like we're, we're more Americanized than the Europeans. Like we've got that, like we, we need a little bit of personality or something or this, like, it's like the, it's almost as if we feel like someone has to have the air to rule about them. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's almost like we, we, we tend to, to, yeah. to gravitate also, towards that kind of figure. Yeah, and I think, you know, you contrast it with the Europeans. I think a big experience that Britain didn't have was being occupied and invaded. So if you think of terrible things that can happen to a country, Britain has avoided most of them for 350 years. For 350 years, no civil war, no revolution, no occupation, uh, no famines. And, you know, terrible things happen in empire, but that was far away. And so I think you get a kind of loss of seriousness over time. So the Johnson Rees Mogg generation, my generation, thinks, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Britain also has no natural predators. I mean, if you're Poland, you have to be serious because there's someone next door who might eat you up. If you're Britain, you know, Brexit might not work out, but Britain can afford to make blunders, as it were, especially if you're the upper class, which has been shielded, has been immune for centuries. And you see that in the buildings they inhabit, you know, the medieval public school, you grow up in a medieval vicarage, you go to medieval public school, medieval Oxford, and then the medieval House of Commons. And if your life has been spent in these beautiful, untouched buildings, you think, well, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, it's, there's, there's definitely something about that. And when you when you first went to Oxford, so I've never been actually. I'm hoping to go at some point. I'm sure it's beautiful, but and, and there's a couple of professors I'm trying to get on on this show. Um, but what is what is it like when you first walk walk into that building? Like, do you feel that that sort of I don't know the timelessness of of those institutions because of that? Like, is is that something that's really like omnipresent in the in the atmosphere? It does feel timeless. I mean, you know, there's Oxford is really, when people talk about Oxford University, it's a square mile in the center of town, which is almost untouched, medieval, beautiful. Beyond that, Oxford, as Bill Bryson says, is quite an ugly city. It's an ugly city with a beautiful bit in the middle. Uh, mostly ugly post-war, a lot of the kind of trappings of, you know, um, that you'll see in most British towns. But in that square mile, you walk around, you walk down the streets at night and you think, is this... 1688 or is it 1988? Because it could be either. And it's a place where nothing changes. And so a lot of the timeless fantasies have been written by people in Oxford, like um, Alice, Won Alice in Wonderland is an Oxford story. Uh, the Hobbit is an Oxford story. And Brexit is that same kind of timeless fantasy that, you know, we can go back in time to the olden days. And so it's a very kind of seductive place. And you do feel, you know, there are ghosts on your shoulders. And one of my very strong memories is the to king and country plaques in, in the chapels all over, you know, to the undergraduates who fell in World War I, especially because, I mean, that, that really struck me and I was thinking about it writing the book. The upper class did sacrifice its own sons in World War I in particular. So, yeah, you feel the ghosts are there, death is there, beauty is there, and timelessness. Yeah, so that... The the point that you made, um, I give everyone this like chapter, I don't remember somewhere in the middle um, about the this this idea that that until sort of uh, around the, the sort of, yeah fifties sixties seventies then all of the people leading the country and all of the people um, yeah they had experienced war like all of our even our leaders like Atlee Churchill. Um, all of them, Labour and Tory, had had experienced war, and and the way that that I had I'd never considered that that la that that was the thing that perhaps like made people more supportive of even just the idea of the European Union because of the peace that that it brought up that it's well seemed to to have maintained since the Second World War. Um, do you really see that as being like a really prevalent part of 
of forming those ideas of, of that club of, of sort of undergraduates that you're describing in the book, like um, Dan Hannan and Gove and, you know, Boris Johnson. Do you think that's, that's a really formative part of it? I mean, if you contrast the World War I generation, and I'm thinking of three prime ministers who went from Oxford to World War I, Macmillan, uh, Clement Attlee, and Anthony Eden. And these are all, you know, they're essentially Boris Johnson and David Cameron 100 years earlier. These are very privileged young men who've grown up separate from the rest of the population. And Macmillan is making his way in the Oxford Union. He goes from Eason to Balliol, the same college that Johnson will go to, he studies, you know, uh, classics, the same degree. He's really Boris Johnson in the summer of 1914. And then he goes to war because the upper class doesn't try and get its sons out of it. It says, you go, you sacrifice. They had no idea what was coming, no idea of the machine gun. And so then these guys become junior officers. Typically the, the public school boy is the captain or the lieutenant who has to write letters to the private mothers when the boy is killed. And, you know, they feel this tremendous sense of responsibility in their 20s for these working class men they're leading and they realize well the world is serious and you know it's a paternalistic relationship so we're not the same as the working classes but we have to look after them and so these men when they go into politics that's the feeling they carry with them forever you know we're all in this together we're high and they're low and it sort of should stay like that the Tories think but we are one nation and one nation exists most strongly in the trenches. So when they, so from 1940 to 1979, almost all the time, Britain is ruled by veterans of one world war or the other. Uh, Harold Wilson, I think, is the only exception. Douglas Hume. So almost all the time, you have a veteran in number 10 who has very much this strong feeling of uh, a responsibility for the whole nation. And then when Thatcher comes in in 79, it's a very equal country. It's the most equal country after Sweden and Europe in economic terms. So Britain's not doing very well. You mean, you well. mean in terms of um, economic wealth equality. inequality? Yeah, okay. Economic equality is, is the second highest in Europe. It's extreme, extraordinarily high. If you went back to 1979 now, for instance, 79, you wouldn't recognize it. I mean, um, TOFs are struggling financially, are paying huge taxes on their mansions, et cetera. And so you get this very equal country shaped in the aftermath of two world wars. And Thatcher comes in and she says, no, it's you know, good that there should be rich people. And it's right that they should send their children to private school and we're gonna widen this. So she's the first kind of post veteran prime minister, the first prime minister not shaped by the world wars personally, or well, not by being in them as, a, as an adult. And that's when the one nation idea, I think, begins to disappear. I don't think it's a coincidence that the veterans and the one nation Britain are co-evil, co-existent. Mm. I wonder why. And the Johnson generation doesn't have that. They've grown up entirely without responsibility, entirely separate from the rest of the population, entirely on serious. Yeah it's, uh, yeah, it's much easier for everything to be rhetorical when it wasn't your mate getting shot at. Or you know when you ha when you haven't been right beside the bomb that you you know that was thrown back after you decide your class or whatever decided to go to war. Yeah, I guess it would be. It'd be very easy for people who don't have to go through that to suddenly become detached from. It. I mean, I guess they they definitely do. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's. It's. Um, I wanted to just. Uh, I I find one of the quotes that I really enjoyed from the book actually. Um, and you had um, someone describing um, Arthur Balfour um, in, well, I can't remember what year it was, but anyway. Uh, and the foreign it, secretary of just over a century ago, Balfour. Yeah. Uh, I think he's Eton and Oxford. Yeah, and it just the, the, the line you were quoting, um, I can't remember who was describing him. It said, he trusted to his unequaled powers of improvisa improvisation to take him through any trouble and enable him to leap lightly from one crisis to another. And I just cracked up and I was just like, is that Boris Johnson? Like, is that who you're describing? And it suggests that like this kind of leader has, has forever come out of these institutions. It makes me wonder like, are, is the next generation of Boris and, and Cameron being schooled right now? Is, is this like, is this just an endless cycle of the same people? I do worry that, and I do think that there's something eternal in kind of British politics, this kind of Eton and Oxford class. I don't know if uh, Balfour was Eton and Oxford, but he was Oxbridge and some posh public school. 
Um, I do think that they have professionalized in the last 30 years. And in the last five years or so, Oxford and Cambridge actually become more open to very, very quickly more open to state school entrance. So they're now close to their record number of state school entrants because they've been scared into kind of diversity by the mood of movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter and the kind of general sense that it's enough now with the tops. So there is a change and students there work much, much harder than in the 80s and 90s. Um, I mean, you know, there's an essay by Boris Johnson's then girlfriend and his future first wife saying that four hours a week, uh, you could get by on four hours a week in the arts at Oxford which I think was probably accurate. I remember <laughs> a survey from the time the average student did 20 hours work a week. Now that has changed. They're much more serious. Uh, the university sits on them much more to make them more serious. There's much less of the Boris Johnson thing of, you know, you read 10 pages and then you write a five page essay and then you uh, kind of bluff your way through the tutorial. That, that doesn't happen so much anymore. <laughs> Um, also, just for reference, uh, you were right in your instinct. Um, Balfour went to Eton. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. They, like, Who would have thought? Yeah. Shock. <laughs> um, the, uh, like, it, 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 like, raises this question for me. Like, do you think it's a bad idea? Because I'm not saying I think it's a good idea. But... Do you want, like, in a, in an ideal scenario, like somewhere where people can think about how to, like, to be taught about how to run a country? Because, or do you think it's something you just shouldn't really teach? Because, I don't know, it, it, there, it, there's a part of me that feels like it's not a bad idea to have, like, a place where it's like, yeah, these are the elite. The, the smartest, most brilliant people. Obviously, that's not what comes out of it all the time. But well, Eton doesn't select for the smartest, most brilliant, most brilliant people. That's never been the that's never been the criteria. Mm. Mm. But yeah, so do do you think it's a like is is it inherently a bad idea to have like these really prestigious institutions that like maybe maybe not concentrated in one specifically is a that's probably bad but do, do you know what i mean about having a place where like the the future like the people who are going to like think about running the country can can like be taught and educated on that you know i at the end of the book i say so what should we do with oxford and cambridge and i agree with you that they have qualities there is something you know beautiful about them a chance to think i i would see what I would love is an Oxbridge for all, and also an Eton for all. That we say, you know, Eton, yeah, they, they have good teachers and have great facilities. Let's make it available to a much larger section of the population. Let's have bright kids from all layers of society passing through Eton all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been picked out, you can have three months at Eton, uh, doing this, doing that. Um, maybe we'll give you a one year scholarship. I don't think it should be you're there the whole time because that creates a separate cast. I mean, France, where I live usually, has that with the, the ENA, this graduate school that trains the future leaders. Four of the last six presidents, including Macron, went to ENA. And it creates, I mean, it's more meritocratic than Oxbridge, but it does create this cast of people who think they're brilliant and are separate from the rest of society. And it inevitably creates this looking down on the rest situation. So, I don't think people should be kind of branded by it, but I would love Oxford and Cambridge to say, you know, you're 37 years old, you never went to university because of your circumstances, but you've shown us that you're very bright. Come here for a year. And we'll fund that through corporate conferences some of the time. We'll also have great graduate schools, but what we're not gonna do is take in 18 year olds based largely on um, their interview, entrance interview, which again is the ability to talk and then uh, massively over-favoring the, the private schools. So essentially uh, favoring the cast that selected age zero. So let's have Oxbridge for all. Let's in use it to enrich the whole country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would, that, would, that would be fantastic. I mean, I think that the, there's probably a lot more meritocracy at least than there used to be. That was the sense I got. There was quite a few people from my school ended up actually going to Oxford or Cambridge. It's becoming more, they're becoming better at saying to state school people, you know what, you can apply, you should apply and come to a summer school the summer before you finish and, and that will get you used to the whole thing. They're, they're getting better at it. Yeah. Yeah. So when when you were approaching some of the people for writing this book, were, how did they feel about, like, were they willing to be interviewed? Do they kind of like own this? They're just like, well, yes, this is obviously what, like, because part of me thinks, you know, would they be, 
unwilling maybe to speak as much with, uh, about you know their time in in Oxford or like how what sh- what it sh- how it shaped them or just the way in which you're kind of articulating how a very small group of rich and wealthy and influential people like go from like their schooling through the conveyor belt like you said the whole way to yeah the house of commons number 10 downing street were they unwilling to speak about that or were they quite forthcoming like do they just sort of own it i the ones i got to you know of course they're self-selects because they're willing to talk to you but they they own it they're very happy to talk so i remember particularly mind you with jacob reese mogg who was an exact contemporary of mine you know we arrived the same day and uh, Daniel Hanan, who's the kind of thinker of Brexit, mm-hmm. Karl Marx, <clears throat> the guy who has the vision. Hanan actually sort of has the vision at Oxford, and then he spends 25 years um, pushing it until the referendum comes and he wins. So I interviewed them both. They were very friendly. I mean, they, they realized, certainly Hanan did, that I came from the other side of the ideological spectrum, but we spoke very amicably. Of course, in their mind, Oxford is uh, strictly meritocratic, and they got there because they're brilliant, and everyone there is selected on brains. Oh, and of these course. Kind of, of um, course. Class uh, wars have no place because, uh, you know, you end up where you belong, and it's all just desserts. So, um, yeah, they, they don't feel any kind of, I think, issues with um, how power gets made. I mean, that, that's why I wanted to write the book. I think an elite is a really important thing to study because it tells you who has power in the country, how they get power. Because with power, you can do a lot. You give money to people, you take money away from people, you do Brexit, you guide the country in directions that are unstoppable for everyone else. I mean, look, 17 million people voted for Brexit. The book's not mostly about Brexit. 17 million people voted for Brexit for all sorts of reasons. I wanted to look at the group of people who led it and who then implemented it. Mm. Yes, I mean, that th- that's very much the... So I, yeah, I, yeah, everyone go buy my book on Brexit if you don't want to re- read Chums. They should, they should. <laughs> but in, in the book, I kind of talked a lot about the, the free, like the, the free market neoliberalism that sort of is quite characteristic of a lot of the people who were at least in Boris Johnson's cabinet at the time of Brexit. Uh, people like Quasi Quartang, Liz Truss, um, Sajid Javid, uh, Michael Gove, just yeah. There's there's a whole there's a whole like sort of more libertarian neoliberally sort of wing of the party. So, but one of the things I didn't really go into was where their ideas came from. So, what was it that that formed Han- um, Dan Hannan's Brexit sort of dream? Like, w- what prompted this vision of the sunlit uplands that we've all been gifted now thirty years later? Well, let's look at the two great ideologies. One is the free marketeerism, which you mentioned. You see, I think that they believe that, but their problem is that Thatcher did most of it. So Thatcher's their heroine, but by the time she's done, when you know they've barely left university or they're still there, the UK has moved so far to the right on taxes, on privatization, on uh, free cap- free movements of capital. There's not really much more for them to do. And if you're gonna go any further, you start to become like Brazil, you know, you become a, a sort of not recognizably anymore a, a Western state. So Thatcher had kind of finished that revolution largely. You saw that John Major in seven years didn't really have much to add to it. I mean, they privatized the rail, which, mm-hmm. you know, was kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of crazier end of privatization. Mm-hmm. So what they had left was nothing originally. They don't know what their project is. They're, they're right wing, they're headed for power. What is their project? And the thing they believe most sincerely, I think, is that we are the people who are chosen to run the country because we are male, public school, Oxford, Tofts. And those are the people who naturally should run the country and who've run the country for generations. And so I think a big kind of awakening call for them is when Thatcher gives her bruise speech in September 88. So that's two or three weeks before Rees Mogg and I start university, just after Cameron and Johnson have left. And she says, look, the single market's great, but these crazy Europeans are going to do political union. And that's terrible. They're going to take away the power of Westminster. They're going to have this super state. And that speech, most British people don't really care that much <laughs> because nobody asked them to run the country ever. But the, it speaks very directly to the Oxford Tory public school boys, because they think, hang on, running Britain is my gig. That's what I'm going to do when I'm big. And now it turns out these Brussels bureaucrats are going to take away the powers of Westminster, the powers of Westminster. That's us. That's our caste. 
And so it's like a dagger to the heart. It, it really is very, very close to what they care most about. And that's what radicalizes Hanan when John Major's planning to sign the Federalist Federalizing Maastricht Treaty in 1990. Hanan gets a couple of mates together, one of whom is Mark Reckless, who will later become a UKIP MP at Oxford. You know, he's 19 years old, Hanan. He's in his first term at Oxford. And he says, look, we have to create this campaign for an independent Britain, he calls it. And they meet in the King Queen's Lane coffee house on the Oxford High Street. So the campaign for an independent Britain, December 1990. And that looks a lot now like the starting signal for Brexit. And now then spends 25 years. He co-creates the European Research Group at the at Westminster. He becomes a secretary. He co-creates Brexit from that moment on. That's a really interesting way of looking at it as to why that class of people was so because you can you kind of touch on this as well actually that this the so my book was called the the establishment civil war and like one of the points i was making was that like broadly for as long as so at least since the, the the end of the second world war like the british establishment has been like broadly in consensus on on policy yes. um and this was like the first like really notable split in the establishment and uh, so it's really interesting that you suggest that some of them were sort of like a bit miffed that the Europeans had come in and been like, well, what do you mean? These, these bureaucrats can just walk into your job and run, run Britain. That's my thing. Like <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting. Well, what you say about the United establishment, that's very interesting. I touch on that well. And there's a couple of breaches in the establishment over time. So usually, you know, right and left agree on issues like war and Europe and everyone's a good chap. And a big breach in that is the appeasement debate in 1938, when people get really, really emotional. And they, they think, you're not a good chap, actually, you're appeasing Hitler, you're a bad chap, even though we went to school in Oxford together. And then when World War II starts, everyone gets on board, that split is healed. Thatcher also creates a split, because a lot of people, even among the Tories, think, no, that's going too far. This is, you're destroying the Britain we love. But then eventually she wins, and the Labour leaders who come after from Blair say, OK, you know, uh, we accept a lot of the tenets of Thatcherism. So the establishment heals itself again. And you're right, in 2015, I think when Corbyn comes in and then the Tories split over Brexit, you get a divided establishment, which is very rare in Britain. Mm. So, so do you think, it, is there, was there anything else in that? Was it that, that caused that? that split because for me it had always been the the sort of romantic free trading like swashbuckling britain that that they sort of the rhetorical idea of what britain used to be that 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 was the the people who were hanging on to that vision that were the people who had decided that britain could once again be great like whatever that was meant to mean (laughs) Do you think it is that that idea of of Brussels coming in and sort of stealing their thunder almost? Uh, It's partly that. Look, I think there's two visions of what Britain should be. And there's a kind of, let's say, a left-wing vision, which is Britain, the NHS is at the core of it, and Britain becomes better as it cares for more people and uplifts more people. And that's kind of the vision that Labour has plugged in different forms over the decades. And then there's a vision of national greatness, which... The Tories have more of, Labour has it a bit, which is, look, we're a great country. We're not just any old country. We rule the course of the world. We won these world wars. Uh, And if you're a British tough, you think my caste did that. You also think my caste, Oxbridge stroke public school, wrote Alice in Wonderland, um, you know, wrote The Hobbit, wrote 1984, invented Keynesianism, invented the television, uh, co-invented the computer and the atom bomb. You know, we did these amazing things. We invented all modern sports. If you're a British male top, you think those are my people who did this. And so this is how you're raised at Eton in the 70s and 80s, if you're Reese Marvel Johnson, reading these books about great things Britain did and these wonderful battles, which you always won. And then you grow up and you head for Westminster and you think, hang on, that's all gone. Now we're just an outpost of the EU. 
And when you become a minister, you take the Eurostars to Brussels all the time and you sit in these boring meetings where they argue about rules for plastic bags and you have to listen to the Latvian, you know, Minister of Environment in his cheap suit bang on about something in Globish. <laughs> and you just think, where has our greatness gone? And I think for Tories, that, that is a hugely upsetting thing for, the, for that group because for them, history and rule is not about improving the NHS a bit. It's about doing something bloody great. And that chance had been taken away. And I think that is the emotional appeal of Brexit for them. It's a bit like the charge of the light brigade, you know, something glorious and swashbuckling, but with less personal risk. Hmm. Wasn't the charge of the light brigade like a, wasn't it like a, a misheard order? Like the, yeah, the, it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. it, it was a mistake. Uh, no, I'm not going to draw the parallel with Brexit. Yeah. But I think it was Longfellow who um, immortalized it, this wonderful poem, which I'm not going to attempt to paraphrase. Mm. And so the beauty of language and the beauty of the image of the scene and the kind of British men doing something glorious, even if it's a complete disaster. Um, I think that is a lot of what they are raised on. I mean, Evelyn Waugh talks about it in Brideshead. He'd been raised on glorious battle. And they had been raised on glorious battle. But by the 1990s, early 2000s, there were no more glorious battles being fought, you know, or at least far away in Iraq, and that quickly went wrong. It was Labour government anyway. So they, they wanted some a bit more glory back in their politics. I think Brexit, I mean, different people had different reasons for Brexit, but I think that was a, a, a very big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the biggest fight people can have these days is, like, on Twitter. <laughs> the most war you can have. <laughs> well, look, look at uh, Johnson's veneration for Churchill. It's also envy. You know, and Churchill lived in interesting times, and Johnson hadn't lived in interesting times. I mean, I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's still sitting there bored, um, but uh, <laughs> it's de we're definitely cursed once again with interesting times. I mean, I guess, it, well, he, it, he's... He idolizes a man who, you know, has all obviously, you know, a lot of very well documented flaws, but it seems like at least for the years during which he had to step up, it seems like he did, at least to an extent enough to which this country still exists. Um, whereas Johnson has just like bounced from one catastrophe to the next, really, um, not regaining anywhere near the respect or the the, the success I mean, that Churchill has had. Like, why do you think he idolizes a man and yet doesn't seem to express or seem to have any of the characteristics that pe that endear him to, to people? Well, I mean, he grew up reading books about British heroes like Churchill, and Churchill was kind of top of the pantheon. And that is what he wants to be when he grows up. I mean, asked once why he left journalism for politics, he said they don't put up statues for journalists. And I think the end game is a statue in Parliament Square. That, that's what it's supposed to be, and that's what Brexit is about in part. And that kind of inscribes him in uh, the footsteps of Churchill. I mean, of course, we can see there's no direct comparison, but you say catastrophe, he stumbles from one catastrophe to the next. The thing is that we don't really live in, an, in a catastrophic age for all the carnage of COVID. And, you know, there would have been some carnage under another prime minister, but less. Britain, you know, is not in a kind of existential struggle the way it was in World War II. And it's also not bestriding the world. It is just a, a kind of not hugely important um, island off the coast of Europe. And so, yeah, I mean, he's a lesser figure, or he's an infinitely lesser figure, but it's also a less, for now, so far, it's a less significant age. And that's also why people have been unserious enough to vote for an unserious person. A lot of the electorate thinks what could possibly go wrong. Wow. And then we have COVID, you know, so ironically, yeah. right, you elect an unserious person and then the worst public health disaster um, in 100 years comes along. Yeah, yeah, I mean, oh. Yeah, which brings us quite nicely, I'd say, to to one of the the closing chapters of the book um, about yeah the the COVID contract corruption. Um, I, this this particular issue, I do not understand why there is not just outrage on the highest levels 
from everybody, from every, like, what, you know, all the people who think, so, I don't know, so the, 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 the pandemic, like, lockdown debate thing was, I don't know, kind of left-right split. So all the people who hate the Tories should have been horrified at the, the exploitation of, you know, the worst public health crisis, as you've put it. Uh, like the deaths of people, like the, the, they were standing on the graves of the people who died to hand like millions and millions of pounds to their to their mates. Billions. Billions. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Billions. And uh, how, how did this happen? <laughs> what? I mean, you see, I don't think they hugely intended to be corrupt. It was this this disaster happens, COVID, and they think, well, uh, how do we procure all this equipment and test? How do we do tests and trace? The normal thing would be to work through the civil service, but Johnson was never interested in running the country. So he, at the time, he was letting Dominic Cummings do that. He did want to run the country, and Cummings said, "You know, the civil service disaster zone, boring procedures they have, time wasting. Um, let's move fast and break things." And so. Everyone has a mate who does has a business that uh, could do masks, say. So you call your mate, and what's happened? It what happens to be at Oxford with you. Handy, you know, quick way of fixing things. And then you quickly need to put someone in, in charge of tests and trace. So you, you give your mates all these contracts because they say, yeah, no worries, we can have that for you next Wednesday. And you avoid all these boring civil service procedures where you have to get 10 contracts of bidding, that kind of thing. And then you say, okay, well, a good example is we need someone to run the test and trace thing. And then somebody knows Dido Harding because she was at Oxford. She was a PPE uh, tutorial partner of David Cameron. And she's a, she had been CEO of Talk Talk, the telecoms company, not very successful CEO, but still CEO. And no experience in health, but as a civil servant says to the media, she was not elected, she was not chosen for experience with health. She was chosen for her leadership skills. And in Britain, leadership skills is code for being upper class. She's very upper class. I think her grandfather was a World War II general. So Dido Harding is put in charge of tests and trace. They spend £39 billion. Pounds, and there is no noticeable impact at all on the progress of the pandemic. It doesn't seem to slow COVID by 25 seconds. £39 billion. Pounds. And so, you know, why was she there? They knew her. There was no competitive bidding process for that job. On the other hand, to be fair to them, they need someone to run the vaccine program. It becomes clear we need vaccines. Who's good on vaccines? Oh, Kate. Kate Bingham, venture capitalist, indeed many decades of experience in farmers, put in charge of the vaccines program, was at Oxford with them. Her husband was at Oxford. But actually, it works out brilliantly. Britain gets vaccines before any other major current country, so kudos to Kate. So mostly these pandemic, these charmocracy appointments don't work. But um, I have to give them that the vaccines won't happen to work. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think they were, they were seeking to line people's pockets. Of course, the result is you do line people's pockets. Um, Rupert Soames, former president of the Oxford Union, who also features in my book, runs the, the, the services company Serco. He makes several million out of uh, getting some of these contracts completely above board. But that's what happens if, you, if you're going to call your mates and say, can you help us out? I mean, the, the thing that gets me is just that... It seems like we kind of just shrug and accept this like old boys network. And, and that was the, do you think that is stronger than the British political system? Because it seems like in crisis, we like no one turned to the civil service. They turned to the, to the old boys network. I mean, it's partly that Cummings and Johnson are quite unusual in that in their different ways, they don't believe in the establishment. Actually, they're anti-establishment figures in that they will tear anything down. So you see now that Johnson is putting number 10 in charge of the Electoral Commission. So he's dismantling the institutional arrangements of Britain, might do with the BBC as well. And someone like Cameron, like, say, Anthony Eden in the past, believed in the institutions of Britain, you know, was much, much more slow to uh, dismantle. And so it's a very dangerous combo. I mean, Cummings now gone. But it's very dangerous to have someone like Johnson who he's a kind of nostalgic toff, but he doesn't care at all about the institutions that he sits on top of. Mm. So that's the kind of Trumpian side of him, the, the willingness to tear it down and to break rules. Yeah. Do you think that the the fact that the institutions are all like so this is this is the part that I, I yeah. 
the institutions have become to an extent dependent on which one you're talking about and how cynical you are either useless corrupted or stacked with this yeah cast of 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 yeah like a certain class of people and part of me thinks well is that a bad thing if if they're you know that they get torn down like, i mean is 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 that it's weird to see that kind of attitude coming from someone who would not be there without from you know but for the system that currently yeah like, he's risen through the system yeah. he's in oxford in the commons yeah i mean he's he's been through every institution but johnson only cares about himself that he's only serious about one thing himself and that's quite unusual so cameron wasn't really like that mm. so what is it do you think that maintains this network so because like you yeah you, you yeah you, you sort of map their 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 transition from university the whole way through um like some of them getting appointed to think tanks journalists or like different papers or some of them um going straight into politics and eventually rise into the the position they're in now what do you think it is that keeps that network so tight because i mean i i go to university i went to university i mean there's still some people that i'm friends with i knew some people who were in like the the law society um that were yeah really good friends of mine that, that i helped campaign with them a couple of times i mean we uh i did yeah a friend of mine was like president of the politics society um but like the, those connections like some of them i'm still i'm still in touch with and friends with but they they don't remain or it doesn't seem that they they're the same kind of strength of of connection that is made at oxford mm. or by this sort of cast of people what do you think it is that that makes it so strong and and yeah maintains it through through many decades? Well, the word I use in the subtitles there are castes. I, I originally was calling them the ruling class, and I don't think it's it's strictly economic. There are castes because they grow up together and they live together in the same school for many years. Now, you and I saw our school friends for eight hours a day. And some way, you know, we still touch with, still like. But imagine if you'd seen them 24 hours a day. You slept in the same rooms. You played your sport with them all the time. You were never apart. And then also, if you're very much at off, that your parents probably knew each other, grandparents. It's a very small cast. I mean, I calculate about 1% of the British population went to boarding school. 7% private school, 1% boarding school. So that boarding school cast is really tied together so deeply, you know, and they marry each other's siblings, they um, go to each other's parties, and they all come down, as they call it, from Oxford to London en masse. And so you really live in the same city, if you're in the British power elite, for your whole adult life. So their ties are immensely deep, and just with a couple of words, they can recognise each other. Just two words are often enough to establish that you are a member of that caste. So what is what is it that you that you think we should we should do about this? Because obviously, and I think I think just actually on a note on on your use of the word cast, I think that is a really accurate way of looking at it, because people I don't know I I see people get, talk about like say the ruling elite or the ruling class or you know it's all just this like it's all like the same I don't know families or groups of people or the same heritage and it's the same people's grandfathers and great grandfathers and the whole way up and i just I, i'm always like no like they as you've kind of pointed out a couple of times like the, the the ruling class has become or the the cast has become more accepting of anyone with like talent and and all well and money as well who will sort of who falls in and just sort of gets they get they, they go into like a, yeah, almost they, like a melting pot sort of thing. Yeah, they, they absorb they absorb some people from outside. They're also safer because so Michael Gove is a little bit outside that cast. He he grows up to quite ordinary parents in Aberdeen, does go to private school. But the ruling cast likes to pick up people like you know Michael Gove or Andrew Adonis, uh, people from quite ordinary backgrounds but with talent. Mm. And then it bring, Oxford is a way of kind of taming the differences, teaching them the accents, teaching them which cutlery to use, teaching them to feel at home in a medieval setting, and then they can go on to the commons. And it stops them becoming revolutionaries. So the core is this, these hereditaries, the kind of boarding school caste 
of which Cameron is you know, a great exemplar. But um, they're always bringing some people in from outside. It's just that the boarding school cast are the people who oversaw Brexit. Mm. So what do we do about this? Because I'm not particularly like keen on this continuing to be the case in Britain. I mean, it's it would be nice if we could, uh, you know, elect a couple of just just a couple of boring technocrats, maybe just one or two. Just and... well, I mean, Gordon Brown was an uncharismatic technocrat. Uh, John Major was an uncharismatic technocrat, and these people were hounded all the time for being uncharismatic. Yeah, well, I mean, the press has probably got a lot to answer for on that on that front. I mean, but. But even then, I mean, they're giving Keir Starmer quite an easy ride. Um, and Keir he's, Starmer's an uncharismatic technocrat. Yeah, he, but he's... he's doing always say he's boring. Yeah. I think, who cares? Yeah, I mean, boring would be all right. I mean, we've we've had a bit of a wild one for like five, six years. Like, boring would be fine. <laughs> Just give, give me some boring. <laughs> I say that. I, I mean, what, what, what can we do? I mean, what, one, one reason I wrote the book was to say to people, look, you think... These people seem a lot more than they are because they've been taught principally to speak and to write well. So they have this kind of um, rhetorical persuasiveness and elegance. You've got to see through that. Often they don't know what they're talking about because this British elite education focuses so much on presentation skill. And the other thing I think is that we do need to democratize Ox- Oxbridge. I think these are great institutions, potentially great institutions. There's a lot of knowledge there. I'm, I'm actually more of an institutionalist than Johnson. I want to preserve his institutions, but I don't want them to be kind of um, being a leg up for 18-year-olds uh, who've been to boarding school forever and ever. I want so many more British people to have a chance to pass through them, not necessarily for three years, but for a few months. I think it could be transformative of people's education and confidence and just equalizing, spreading education of that kind of across the whole population because mm. i mean it's got to be it's got to be inspiring as well like because this isn't all like oxbridge is i don't i don't want it to sound like oxford's like the timelessness and the heritage and the 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 very ancient nature of it is a bad thing i mean it's it's, it's got to inspire some people to go on to do great things as well uh, like they can think about some of the the people that once walked those halls i mean it's 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 great to be able to have like heritage and, and and institutions that have been there for a long time because generally when things have been there for a long time there's a reason they've been there for a long time like they've got there's there's like a utility to like a like a strong institution but i hope i hope we can get a bit of institutional renewal that would be nice rather than tearing them all down I agree. Yeah. But anyway, that feels like a nice place to, to leave things. Um, everybody, Simon's book, Chums, uh, go check it out. Really, really enjoyed it. Great read. Um, is there anything you want to plug apart from the book? Uh, I've written three books in the last 14 months. So I mentioned Chums, The Happy Traitor, my, my biography of the British double agent George Blake, and uh, Barca, my book about FC Barcelona. So I've had a very busy pandemic. Yes, and I've also ordered your book, Soconomics. That sounds fascinating. Um, even yeah. even if you got the World Cup prediction wrong, <laughs> um, but yeah, Simon, uh, really appreciate it. Links for all of your stuff will be in the description below for people. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe, and if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.